Thank you, Farah. So I think, Sophie, you had Amy on your first slide. I have Ted. Uh, probably you all know Ted Bundy, who is uh, this famous criminal, was this famous criminal. He got executed about 30 years ago, so it's uh, kind of an anniversary year for him. Uh, yeah? Yes. Now, uh, people that first met Ted thought he was really a very nice guy. He was very agreeable, charming. He uh, had a lot of interest. He had a good line opening for about every subject there was. Um, and uh, he did a lot of things. He was uh, uh, campaigning uh, for, for a Republican uh, campaign. He was actually working on a suicide uh, crisis unit where he helped people that wanted to commit suicide, etc. Uh, here you see him on the uh, screen smiling. And why is he smiling here? He's actually, uh, he was uh, his own lead attorney in his murder trial because he got into this row with his attorney and he said, I can do a better job. He was a former law student, so he had some knowledge about law and he defended himself but got the electric chair anyway. This is Ted Bundy, maybe how his victims saw him before they, he murdered them. So he had these two faces. And this is uh, actually the core of what psychopathy is. Hervey Cleckley is a psychiatrist who wrote a book in 1941. I don't know if someone read it, but it's, uh, you can download it from the internet. It's for free. And he really gives a very nice clinical examples of what psychopaths look like. And his idea is that you, this is kind of a hybrid um, condition where you, on the surface, they seem very normal people. Uh, they have this, what he called in his book, the mask of sanity, but underneath you have this profound affection deficit. So there's something really wrong with these people. And he even compared this to people with schizophrenia. He said, uh, psychopaths are really that impaired that you can compare them to uh, really acutely psychotic patients. Now, he, these examples he gave, uh, they, some other researchers elaborated on this to get a measure to diagnose psychopathy because up until 1980, we didn't have a good measure for this. So it was just uh, clinical feelings of what psychopathy was. And uh, Robert Hare is a forensic psychologist. He was working in the prison system and he tried to get articles published on psychopathy. And he always got reviews back saying, well, your concept is not uh, 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 good defined, so you have to have a good measure. And I think it was 1976, he gathered 50 experts on the field to talk about what is psychopathy. And uh, the conference started not so good uh, as I uh, understood because one of the participants said, well, I object to you as a leader of the conference but because I think you're a psychopath yourself, Bob Hare. So Bob Hare said, okay, so why do you think I'm a psychopath? Well, for one, uh, I think you're very impulsive because just a few weeks ago, you emailed me to, com me to come to the conference as an expert. Yes, Bob said, but that was not actually the case because this other expert, I wanted to come, he couldn't come at the last moment, so I contacted you as a replacer. So one can wonder what kind of person Bob Hare himself is, but I don't want to go into detail. I met him a few times and he's a quite a special guy. Anyway, so he came back from the conference and he made this uh, checklist, it's called the Psychopathy Checklist, was first published in the 1980s and then we got a revised version in 1991. And that really has become the golden standard of what we call psychopathy now. Now how does this work, this Psychopathy Checklist? Um, you have to have a lot of file information to be able to score the instrument. So with a lot of file information, and an additional interview with the offender or the patient or the client, you can score 20 items. And these are 20 items relating to psychopathic traits. 
Now each item you score is either present or absent or partially present. Then you get a score from 0 to 40. And Bob Hare said, if you rise to a cutoff score of 30 and above, then you qualify as a psychopath. If you score under 30, you're not a psychopath. So that's a categorical measure. Now, more recent research has shown that it's actually a dimensional scale. So the more psychopathic traits you have, the more likely you uh, uh, are a psychopath. Now, this instrument is really very well validated. Psychometrics are very good. And it has been in a variety of contexts. So it has been validated in prisons, in forensic psychiatric population, in civil psychiatric population, in uh, the population as a whole, etc. So what is psychopathy then? According to Bob Hare and our uh, common uh, understanding at this point, it is a combination of traits that comprises four uh, features. You have interpersonal features. These are persons, when you uh, meet them, they are very glib, they are narcissistic, they are really superficially charming, but very dishonest and manipulative. The core features of psychopathy are really the effective features. So they, these are very callous people, they lack guilt, they don't have empathy, and they have this shallow effect, which makes that they, they are not able to really emotionally uh, attached to other people. And then you have their lifestyle, which is very impulsive, they're reckless, they want to be where the action is, they're very uh, sensation-seeking, uh, impulsive, they really get into a lot of problems from early on, even if a child, early behavioral problems, and it just goes on throughout their life. And they don't have a good, they, they cannot control their uh, behavior very well. Very self-centered people, always looking out for number one, is always the most important person. Um, they're not, as opposed to psychotic people, their reality testing is okay. So they don't, uh, they are in touch with reality and seemingly they are very rational people. If you give them, they don't have any conscience, but if you give them moral reasoning task, they do quite well. They know cognitively what to respond, but they just don't care. They just don't feel it. That's the problem. They often uh, will act in an impulsive way, but they, what, what really uh, differentiates them from, for example, other uh, patients with uh, uh, violent behavior is they, they act in an instrumental way violent way. So they will use violence in order to obtain another goal, whether it is to take your money and, uh, or whether it is to gain status among your peers. So it's really uh, instrumentally use of violence. Now why is psychopathy so important for us uh, I'm working in forensic context in prisons and in forensic institutions? Because we want to predict who is going to recidivate, who is going to do another crime, another violent crime, when we release them. And as a single risk factor, psychopathy is the most important one. So this has been uh, a lot of publishment about this, there's no doubt about that. But uh, it would be a mistake to um, conclude that psychopathy is synonymous with violence because it is not. Not all psychopaths are violent. A lot of them will be violent, but not all will be violent. And certainly not all violent people are psychopaths. The prisons are full, full with violent people who act uh, out aggressively for a number of reasons, among which psychopathy is just one of them. So these are the items on the psychopathy checklist. I'm not going to go through all of them, it would be, take too much time. But what is important here is you have these two factors in the scale, uh, and the two factors are divided into even four facets. Uh, and factor one is really what gets to the core of psychopathy or, or the interpersonal affective features. Factor two is more the behavioral impulsive lifestyle. Um, and you mentioned con men, for example, what would they, would they be psychopaths? They would 
most probably a lot more on the factor one feature and not so much on the behavioral aspects. Now, I've been saying that uh, the PCLR is really the, the best measure we have, the best, the best we can do at this time, but there are some recent studies that have caused some doubt as to the checklist itself can be manipulated. So these are field validity studies. Um, when I talk about research on the PCLR, it's uh, very, uh, it's done by researchers who are very well trained in a uh, well-controlled situation. But if you see how it is done in real life, uh, it's really the, the validity really drops. And uh, I did one of the studies in Belgium. I'm going to show you the iterator reliability of the scale. Now, I, um, I was doing file research in the prison system and in the hospitals. And I saw some people went from prison to hospital, and then they had two scores. So I had about 75 people who had two scores. And what was amazing was that the psychologists in the hospital never knew that they already had a score in prison. So that was a first remark. But then I compared the scores, and if you have an instrument uh, which has uh, very large implications, you should get uh, interrate re re reliability of 0.80 would be great, but 0.60 would really be a minimum, and I found uh, uh, 0.44. I found 17% of the scores, they were differed in more than 10 points, so that's really a huge difference. Uh, in the U.S., this might be difference between life and death. Some states uh, use the death penalty and they use the PCLR as to see if you should get the electric chair or not. So it's, it's really a big thing. Now, what is wrong with uh, these guys? We know now, and we know this from mainly from brain imaging studies, that they have three characteristics in common. Uh, although they do, do not necessarily um, know how to react to, to some emotions, they have particular difficulty to recognize uh, other people's fear, other people's distress. So if, for example, they see a fearful face like the one you see on the picture, they would not respond to that. They would have difficulty seeing that this guy is, uh, uh, has anxiety, has fear. Um, and because of that, they do not have this compassionate use we have when we see these people, we want to help them and we want to be compassionate, etc. They, do, they do, not, do not feel that, they do not recognize that. And this uh, is because their amygdalas, this is the emotional uh, center of our brain, is under reactive to fear. Now, uh, there have been some studies uh, with people who do not have amygdalas, for example, and they are really profoundly impaired uh, in this area. And psychopaths, uh, it was uh, um, studied several times that the amygdala is under-responsive to fear, and also the amygdalas are uh, smaller than average by about 18 to 20 percent. Another thing that is interesting that other researchers have looked at the opposite of psychopathy, that is people that are really very high on altruism. For example, people that give their kidney to complete strangers. And um, uh, Abigail Marsh is one researcher that's found that in these people you find exactly the opposite. So you find people that are very good at recognizing other people's fear, amygdalas that are over-responsive and are even larger than normal. So that's, that's also an interesting finding. Psychopaths, so they're not good at this. They're also not very responsive to very happy things, very happy faces, or laughter, for example. When you have a lot of people uh, that are laughing, you, you have the, the urge to la also laugh. They don't have that as uh, people uh, who are not uh, psychopathic. So the normal social socialization process doesn't work with them. So this is now what we understand is as conventional wisdom of how psychopathy develops. So it is a, a emotional hyper-responsitivity. It results in fearlessness. They do not 
they do not feel the fear like we do, and they have a lack of empathy. This impedes the development of their conscience, and that's how they behave in their antisocial way. That's the conventional wisdom of how we think it works. Now, not everyone agrees on this. For example, one um, scholar is Joseph Newman, and he, well, he doesn't deny that there is an emotional deficit, but he says how it, uh, the reason for that is not the emotional problem, it's the attention. They, do, they just don't pay attention to the emotion. So his argument is as long as we can teach them how to focus on emotions, you really can uh, get an emotional response. Of course, you have to do that when you are, they are very small. Now, do we see early warning signs, for example, in children? Yes, we do. There are some children that are at greater risk of developing psychopathy, and we call this CU traits, callous unemotional traits. You can see that in children from 7 to 12 years, or maybe even 5 or 6 year old. These are uh, children that lack empathy, lack remorse, and uh, they're particularly different from other uh, children with conduct disorders. Now, note that if you have a child with callous and emotional traits on the age of 10 years old, it's not so that you can be sure that he will be a psychopath. The stability of these characteristics are not that high, so you have to be careful, but it is a group to pay special attention to. If in the whole population you have about 5% of children with conduct disorder, the, the blue uh, uh, circle, then you would have 1% of them showing these high uh, callous unemotional traits. So these are the people that, uh, the, the children that also have this poor recognition of other people's fear. They uh, report having less fear themselves. They, if they get punished, they don't care. Uh, they are, um, they usually also use this proactive aggression, this instrumental aggression. And if they get caught or they, uh, their mother find out, they do not feel guilty about it. Whereas to the other uh, children who also have these conduct problems, if um, they hurt another child, it will be mostly in a reactive way. And they really feel bad if they, uh, if they uh, are caught, and they also may have uh, higher levels of anxiety themselves. So where do we find these uh, nice psychopathic people? Um, of course, uh, it's no surprise that you find them at an elevated rate in prisons, in forensic institutions. Uh, research there says that you have about 15 to 25 percent of people in the prison system, in the forensic institution, being uh, psychopathic, that is, having a PCLR score of 30 or above. But you also find them in the community. And there the uh, figures are not very accurate because it's hard to do this kind of research, but the estimate is that we have about 1% of psychopaths among us. So I... Um, uh, understood that there are about uh, 100 people at the conference, so <laughs> <laughs> one of them, <laughs> one of you Not is, uh, <laughs> is uh, we see if you get to give the money back or not. Uh, and so the, the general population is 1%, but if you go to a special population that is uh, corporate uh, psychopaths, then you see prevalence rates of about 4%. So Bob Hare said, uh, if I want to study psychopaths, I either go to prison or I go to Wall Street or boardrooms, and there I, I will find a higher level of uh, psychopathy. Now I said this, there is one psychopath here in the room, it may be one of the speakers. Uh, Cleckley gives some nice examples of, clinical examples of psychopaths, and there was one of a professor, a doctor in philosophy, giving lectures, so uh, you might be a psychopath, or there's, uh, yes, there's also one of a psychiatrist in his book, so it's uh, nice to read. There's also someone, and uh, I just mentioned this because it's, it's fun, but um, he's, uh, Kevin Dutton, he studied whether you can link 
profession to level of psychopathy. And here you see a list of uh, professions that are more likely to get people with psychopathy. And you see on number one, you have the CEO. Number two, you have the lawyer. And also in the list of psychopathy, you see the surgeon. Uh, usually the, the doctor is on the good list <laughs> with less psychopathic traits, but you have one exception is uh, the surgeon. Now, you're all skeptical people and you should not believe all that is in this study because this was a self-report internet survey. It was not based on the PCLR, but on a self-report scale. So it may be not that scientific, but it, I thought it just, was just fun to show. Um, so how do we spot them? So we know where to find them, they're everywhere, uh, because if 1% of the population, uh, for example in Belgium we have 11 million people, we have 10,000 people in prison, 15-25% uh, of them are psychopaths, so most psychopaths in Belgium and everywhere are out there, out there to dupe us, to trick us, to get us. So how do we spot them? Now, most likely you don't when you meet them, and this has been said by Johan and the other speakers, uh, it's, it's, it's just very hard because they look like the real thing. At first encounter, he, they are so charming, they are so manipulative, they know how to do, uh, give some good impression management that it is likely that you will not uh, discover them. Now over time, of course, it will become evident that they are pathological liars and manipulators, but it, it can take some time because they do not lie all the time. What they typically do is they may tell some truth they, and at the other time they, or they lie to you. So they keep you on this kind of variable, how do you say that, uh, uh, scheme, um, so that they get you hooked, they get your hopes up, they get your hopes crushed, etc. So it, it will take some time. And uh, Johan also mentioned this, it's not a question that the experts are not right. The experts really do a good job, but they're better. Eh? And even judges get fooled by them. There was a, a nice study by uh, Stephen Porter who showed that if you're a psychopath and you score uh, 30 or above, you're more likely to get parole, to get released from prison, than if you're uh, under 30 scoring if you're not a, 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 not a psychopath. So they're just uh, really good at it. Now, can we trust our gut feeling? Um, just showing a study of a psychoanalyst, Reed Malloy, who has written some, some nice things about psychopathy, and he asked people who interviewed psychopaths, do you feel something when you talk to a psychopath? And actually, 77% of the people said, yes, I really have this uh, a big physical reaction and it's like uh, my stomach turns, I feel on guard, I feel outside myself, uh, he makes my skin crawl, etc. So people have all kinds of reactions. Other, uh, yes, that's the big uh, methodological problem with this study. So uh, the conclusion of, of uh, Reed Milloy was you really should, uh, evolutionarily, you really can feel that you're dealing with a psychopath. And what added up to his argument was that women reported this more than men. So he said evolutionary, it's, it's, uh, you can understand that people, uh, that women are more sensitive because they, they don't have the strength, etc. And also clinicians have this more than law enforcement agents. Um, but of course this study had a lot of methodological problems. For one, uh, he did not test how psychopathy was measured. Uh, he did not know what the countertransference was with, with the non-psychopaths, with these people. So, uh, but it's one of the few studies I found, so I thought I'd mention it anyway. Now, we have problems spotting them. Could they spot us? And Ted Bunny once said, that he really could tell which victim to pick just by the way she walked through the, through the door, by the way she tilted her head, the manner she, uh, in which she carried herself. And uh, one of the researchers, Angela Book, she wanted to test this hypothesis. Could this, there be some truth in this? And what she did was she did this with students first and then with uh, criminals. 
uh, and she actually found it to be true. So they're really picking up on nonverbal cues of uh, victimization. So they asked, she just videotaped um, women and men that were walking and she asked, have you ever been victimized, yes or no, and how many times? And uh, uh, people with high score on psychopathy, they really could pick the victims out just by watching them. And when they asked uh, the criminals, well, what do you look for? Uh, the gate was one of the main things they were looking at. Now, can we treat psychopathy? Now, there has been a lot of uh, pessimism, nihilism among clinicians. And one of the things that you keep hearing also in the media is, please do not try this because if you treat psychopaths, they will only get worse. Now, why do we keep on hearing that? Because there, there was this famous study in 1992 uh, performed by Marnie Rice. And um, what they did is they studied a, a program on a therapeutic program treating psychopaths. And what they found out was when the psychopaths were treated, they actually recidivated at a much higher rate than other people or the psychopaths that were not treated and just were in the prison system. So the, what they figured was that if you treat psychopaths, then you would learn them how to even better manipulate people. They would, you would learn them how empathy works and uh, you try to get some empathy into the psychopaths, which of, of course is not possible, but you learn them the uh, things they shouldn't be learning. That was the idea. There were some other studies uh, that showed the same thing, but um, all of these studies had really big problems. The study of Marnie Rice was a methodologically very good study, only the treatment program was not so good. Because what did they do in this program? They did these uh, marathon psychotherapy sessions who lasted for 24 hours. People were nude. People had to take LSD, you know, because emotions get loosened, etc. So it is a wonder that they even survived the therapy. So it, it was really not a good program, and other studies were really bad on methodological issues. So we had some meta-analysis reviews now, and it is confirmed that we cannot conclude that psychopaths get worse. Now, do they get better? That's another issue. We still didn't find the good treatment for it, but we have some promising results in more recent studies, especially if you start treatment very early in, and you do it intensively. You use experienced clinicians. Of course, this is a big problem. I'm uh, working in the forensic uh, hospital who just uh, got open a few years ago, and we all, almost only get uh, young women with very, uh, not so very much experience working with these guys, so that's a big challenge. You, we have to focus on criminogenic needs, on the behavioral factors. We do not want to make these guys into warm, empathic, good husbands. We just want them to stop being violent, to stop, uh, to, to control better their behavior. That's actually the goal. And we want to do that in a setting that is not chaotic, because chaos, they love chaos. Psychopath loves it. Um, they, they're very thrill-seeking, so it's nice to have some chaos. But also, if the rules are not very clear, if you can, if you find some uh, way into it to, to uh, uh, have some doubt into how the rules work, it's a it's a playground for them. So we have you have to be really structured in your treatment. So what happens if you do take them into treatment? First, it's difficult to get them into treatment because, hey, number one is uh, so great. If you ask psychopaths uh, if, if they come into prison and they face uh, long sentences, okay, and then I ask them, how do you feel about yourself? Great. How, if you would score your life one to 10, what would it be? 10, it's, everything's going fine but you're in prison, okay. So they do not feel the urge to get into treatment. So if you get them motivated, for example, you say you, it's either treatment or prison, okay, they, they will get motivated. 
But in treatment, they show poor motivation, they don't progress like other people do, they drop out of treatment, they do not comply with the rules you set out, they skip sessions, they love two sessions, they love sport, and they love individual therapy, because it's just nice to talk about number one. Um, and they curse a lot, they are very verbally abusive, they threaten people. They are not necessarily physically aggressive in the institution, they can control their behavior there. Um, and they file a lot of complaints. Every week I get several letters from attorneys with psychopaths complaining about everything. Uh, we did a study on this in Belgium also, uh, where we looked at uh, do psychopaths, uh, how did they do in uh, treatment settings, and it found, uh, we found out also that they drop out of treatment quite regularly. Uh, more than about half of them scoring high did not finish the uh, program, and we found this to be related to the factor one characteristics. So the idea of the treatment is focus on the factor two, focus on the behavior, but do not uh, lose the factor one features because these are the ones that's going to make them drop out of treatment. So we really have very often a catch-22 situation here. If you know it's a psychopath, because if you don't know it in prison, they will get released quite easily. If you know it's a psychopath, parole boards will uh, stop them. They will say, you don't get parole because you're a psychopath. You should get into treatment. And then you go to treatment centers and they say, oh, we are not going to accept you because you're a psychopath. So it's really <laughs> a difficult situation. Uh, and then I want to end uh, by a uh, more of philosophical question for is up for discussion. If we now uh, agree on the conventional wisdom that there is something profoundly wrong with these people, they have these effective deficits, and it is because their amygdalas, their prefrontal cortex is dysfunctional. So why do we punish them if we know it's just, they are actually not to blame for that? That's it. Thank you for this very interesting talk, Inga. We have time for a few questions. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> sorry, can you wait for the mic? Yes. And please hold it close to your mouth because yep. some people are yep. having difficulty hearing. Um, you raise the problem. I don't want to go too strongly into psychometrics, but nevertheless, you showed the, the weak reliability of the questionnaire. <laughs> Isn't it as such a bizarre thing to give a self-report questionnaire to psychopaths who doesn't have, in that sense, cognitive but effective uh, abilities to respond to a questionnaire where the person understands the impact has to reply to a questionnaire? So this seems completely counterintuitive, and yet it is still uh, the gold standard. This is very bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, quite uh, explain this uh, correctly. I think the PCLR is not a self-report scale. It's, it's, uh, um, it's an instrument that is used uh, to score the items, but it's the clinician, the psychologist, the psychiatrist that scores the item. And you do this on file review. Uh, and additionally, you do an interview with uh, uh, the, the offender or the patient, but it's not even necessary to do the interview. So you can score the items without the interview. So it's not, it's not self-report, uh, you're absolutely right. It wouldn't be, that's why I, uh, the study I showed by Kevin Dutton, this was a self-report scale, so it, it was not that. When we talk about psychopaths, we mainly talk about men. So uh, why is that? Is it that truly there are um, more male psychopaths or are women just better at hiding their psychopathy? <laughs> well, it, it's mostly a man thing. Uh, there definitely are more male psychopaths and female psychopaths, but, but we don't have a very good uh, prevalence rate on uh, women. There was uh, uh, someone who uh, uh, tried to do a meta-analysis on it and she couldn't give a mean 
prevalence score. She, she said it's between zero and 30%, but we don't have any good, but there are definitely less women. Uh, and if you compare mean PCLR scores, they're usually a bit lower. So a score of 28 on the PCLR, if you're a woman, would equal a score of 30 in a male. And another thing is that the kind of uh, criminal acts they do tend to be uh, different than the ones that they're more, uh, or they try to have men do some uh, aggressive acts for them. So it's uh, qualitatively, it's a different kind of uh, acts they do. But they are out, out there. Yeah. I, I have the microphone, so I'll ask a question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, about the checklist, the hair checklist, you, you mentioned a few meta-analysis uh, studies and, and, and they weren't good yeah. for, for the mm. checklist. It, well, I have two questions. First, could it be possible that eventually we will look upon this checklist as being another psychological form of uh, pseudoscience or pseudoscientific form of psychology, bad psychology? And second, is there an alternative? Well, there are some, well, uh, first of all, I wouldn't s say it's, it's not a good instrument because you will get a lawsuit from Bob Hare. He's very, uh, <laughs> he doesn't like this, he doesn't like that. <laughs> the in, indeed, indeed, he uh, uh, got into a row with a lot of other researchers who, who are uh, critical of his work. Um, there has been a lot of debate whether the, the fourth facet, the antisocial facet, for example, is at the core of psychopathy, and some researchers want to uh, adapt more the triarchic model of triarchic. Yeah, triarchic model of psychopathy. So there, there are other researchers thinking about psychopathy because indeed it is a big, uh, you cannot equal psychopathy to the PCLR and that's what's happening now. So we have to keep on thinking about that. The same is with intelligence. Intelligence is not a wise for, it's, it's about the same. But if you say these things to Bob Harry, he really gets annoyed, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I actually was recently at a conference where one of my colleagues gave a critical talk on the PCLR and a week before his talk, the professor got an email from Bob Hare inquiring what he was going to do. And so if he doesn't like your answer, he will threaten with a lawsuit. It actually happens. Yeah. It's crazy. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very uh, interesting. I have two questions as well. Um, first, you've mentioned narcissism in a, a couple of the slides. Uh, can you tell us if there is a relationship between narcissistic personality disorder and um, psychopathy? And then also, uh, to the point that, that, that they are often in the boardroom, do you have advice for people who, um, who have to encounter a, a, a psychopath in the boardroom you know, every day? <laughs> Yes, as far as uh, narcissism uh, applies, if you, uh, we have this DSM-5, it's a diagnostic manual for psychiatric disorders. Uh, if you relate psychopathy to this uh, personality features, you mainly find antisocial and secondly, narcissistic features. There's really a big correlation between the, the two of them. And uh, this is, uh, yes, in the boardroom you see these, these factor one features like narcissism, egocentrism, you see them a lot. Um, the, the studies on corpus psychopathy showed that the psychopathy was related to um, charisma, charisma and communication skills. They thought these uh, boardroom members were very creative thinkers, they, were, they had good communication skills, but if they did not perform well. If you see what do they actually do in the company, what do they accomplish, do, are they team players? No, they're definitely not. So what can you do? Um, in, in Belgium we say, uh, uh, him blah blah, maar boom boom. So you <laughs> do not believe what they say, but look at what they do. Uh, that's the only thing you can look for. Do psychopaths know that they're psychopaths? Um, if you say, uh, uh, we think you're a psychopath, they say, oh no, I'm not a psychopath, because they know very well the implication of that, so they don't want to have the stigma. If you say, okay, we're going to go over some, some features, and 
uh, then they say, oh yes, yes, uh, I agree, I agree, I agree. So if you go over the features, they, they do agree with it, yeah? Um, I'm going to pick up on your last slide to ask the, the question, has, um, has it been used, like the insanity defense uh, approach, has it been used by, um, in some cases, to people say, yeah, well, I didn't do it, it was my brain who made me do it, or that, you know, they say that, you know, that it's for biological reason, they, yes. they are not responsible for their acts, like has it been, case, has it been used like in, in some legal cases? There have been some case examples where it has been accepted, yes, but uh, what we find, for example, in the brain imaging studies is just on a group level, and you cannot use this on an individual level. You cannot say we do a brain scan and then we predict that you're a psychopath, or it's because we find these features that you are a psychopath. But I have read some uh, cases where they do take this into account in the criminal law. Now Bob here, the author of the psychopathy checklist, he does not agree with that. He says they are responsible for what they do. What he always says that is they, they just, they're born with bad cards, but they know the rules of the game. So for him, they are responsible for what they do. Other people uh, do not agree with that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's for you. Uh, could I say something about this business again of um, uh, asking the question, are they to blame, are they responsible? I think psychiatrists and psychologists like me should be very wary of providing people with labels and scripts that tell them what sort of people they are, what their nature is, what is expected of them. You can, and in particular saying, you are not responsible for your behavior, you are not to blame. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot not affect them in that way. You cannot affect, mm -hmm. you, you must affect them in some way. You must change their behavior by just that single act. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask a question as well. Um, Lack of remorse, uh, lack of conscience, uh, lack of empathy in itself won't cause somebody to go out and murder people mm -hmm. and, and be violent and do horrible things to people. There must be something driving that. So um, in your experience of um, violent criminals, could you say something about that? What, what is it that makes them go out and actually enjoy the, um, the uh, killing, pe killing people or, or hurting people? Well, I'm not sure if they really enjoy it, if, if the psychopathy really makes them enjoy it. If anything, they're really criminal versatile, so they do all sorts of things. They don't not only behave in a violent way, they, they uh, are thieves, they are frauds, they do all sorts of things. Uh, it's not that they really have this thrill for violence. I don't feel it, w w in my encounters with psychopaths, I don't feel that is the, if, if they're really keen onto the, the aggressive stuff, they're more in the statistic. Uh, and there is some correlation between psychopathy and s sadism, but it's not that uh, great. So I think if, if you get people that really enjoy hurting other people, you're more in the sadistic uh, region and you have to have people that score really very high on the psychopathy checklist because uh, a score about 30, you also have very different types of people scoring above 30. So I don't agree that they all have this. Um, Helen, my question is about the last slide, um, and, and it's more about the Ted Bundys of the of the world. Um, the, the the quote was, uh, "Can we punish them uh, because they are uh, yeah psychopaths? It's not their fault." Isn't that beside the question? Don't we need, as a society, to protect innocent victims? And if they can't be cured, well, we have to lock them up forever. Yeah. 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 But can they be cured, actually? 
Yeah, I agree. We have to look at the consequence of what, but it's not because they're not, maybe not responsible that we do not, we cannot lock them up. Maybe it's the best solution to lock them up. Maybe it's the best solution to treat them. It's, it's, a, it's a different question. But maybe this is one I can pass to you because you're the expert or you can answer it. Um, yeah, um, it's a philosophical question actually. I mean, it's a bit simplistic to say, well, if we know they're sick and they have psychopathy, then lock them up forever. Because as, as you have seen, as you have seen when we use the PCLR in practice, we have no inter-rater reliability. So even if someone says that this person has a high PCL, PCLR score, you never know for sure. So if they have committed a violent... Yes, yes, I'm... I'm con if you are talking about people who already have committed a crime and have a high score, of course then you have to protect society. But protecting society really has nothing to do with punishing people. The two things are completely different. So your reasons for protecting society are not the same reasons for punishing. So I think we have to be very careful when talking about that. Of course we have to protect society, but by which means? And the means that we are using today in our society, imprisonment and incarceration in harsh, harsh circumstances, are not uh, conducive to... Um, yeah, to reducing crime. So most criminals do get out of jail at some point, right? 95% of them. So the idea that incarceration and locking everybody up, harsh punishment is going to work, is going to make us safe, is an illusion. We, we can end on this note. I want to thank Inge for her wonderful talk.